It wouldn't be an EHC podcast if it wasn't a CF. All right. Well, Wait, are you guys both drinking? Should I be drinking? I, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a cocktail. He's, he's drinking. He's got orange juice and vodka. vodka. So, yeah, you that's need to get it. You need to get That's a Wednesday food. night drink for you, Hattery. <laughs> yeah. Tuesday yeah. night, whatever it is. I'm bad at technology and days. Uh, yeah, it took us rough, a whole day. <laughs> All right, we're st- welcome to I don't even know what to call this. Well, welcome to Everybody Hates Cleveland, the podcast sponsored by WFNY. That's right. After I don't know a really long hiatus for this podcast, we are back, joined by my former EHC brethren, now WFNY brethren, Jeff Nomina and Mike Hattery. We're here to talk Cleveland Indians baseball, guys. We haven't talked baseball. You know what? Before we talk baseball, two things I got to share with you. One, I. <laughs> I went to I went to Walmart today with sandals on and socks. I, I just wanted to throw that out there. And two, I need to get like cheap cheap ass Cleveland clothing, but it's good Cleveland clothing. So you guys need to help me out because every time I go to Cleveland, it's like important day, and there's eight billion people in town, and I can never get in shops. So either you need to send me free stuff, or you need to but, tell me where to go, or I can either steal it or get it cheap. So just to confirm, first. You made fun of us that it's warm where you are and cold where we are. <laughs> now give me clothes. And then you demanded that we send you free clothing. And then you did a humble brag about how many friends you have every time you come to Cleveland. Yeah. <laughs> I have 8 million friends every time I come to Cleveland. That, I, you know, I only speak truths. That's what this podcast is all about. <laughs> You're just putting in our place before we start this, aren't you? You're just making sure to assert, assert your dominance. Somehow, somehow, this feels like this feels sort of like, um, like, uh, like, like I'm in the mystery machine right now because everything I said wasn't a humble brag, but now that you put it that way, I'm just gonna ride with it. So, because <laughs> right now I it's freeze, it's like 32 degrees, and I put sandals on to go to Walmart, and I just I'm literally sitting here with jeans on, a sweatshirt, sandals, and socks. Which, according to my twelve-year-old daughter, is not the way to go. According yeah, to anyone. Yeah. <laughs> according to I. <eyes>. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh! Speaking of eyes, we're going to be talking about the Indians outfield, and we got to put a lot of eyes on it last year as we head into this year. How about that for a segue? But um, I, I, as we talk about the Indians at this off season, we haven't spoken in person since the world series. So I guess uh, the Indians, I, I, my first question before we talk about the outfield, cause I, I know where that's going to go. Um, you know, Mike and I podcasted a ton, Jeff, you were in on a couple of those. I don't know. Like, what are your thoughts? Just them getting to the world series, them literally being a walk off hit away. And the way things have been working for Cleveland this year, I, you know, when they came up in the bottom of the ninth, I really thought they were going to win that game. They didn't. I, just your general thoughts, uh, starting with you, Jeff. I, I feel like I've, I've, I've cried myself out about it. You know, I, I was, there was just so much misery for so long, and I'm just kind of – I'm to the acceptance phase. I mean, it was, it was a hell of a ride. Uh, it, it felt like we are playing with house money the whole time. I thought we were losing game seven the whole time when Rajay finally – you know, put that one over the wall. I started to believe a little bit, but I, I, you know, I think we've all written some sort of, you know, heart wrenching piece about this already, but it didn't hit me as bad as I thought it would because it felt like we were playing with house money the whole time. And I also think for as good as we were, and I guessing I might get a little pushback on this, but there was a lot of just luck and fluky things that went into all of that and that happening, you know, Coco Crisp suddenly becoming our power hitter uh, <laughs> in the playoffs, stuff like that. That you know, I as awesome as that was, as well as I think we're set up moving forward. I do think that there's this temptation to think that that squad, if we tried them right back out, would get right back to the same place. And and yeah, maybe it's just being romanticized by the the off season here, and it's you know wooing me a little bit to to come up with the trade machine. But I do think they need to do some things around the edges. What about yeah. you, Mike? Your, your first um, really full year in Cleveland, and you get, I, I don't know, maybe we every time a season starts, we need to come over to your apartment and rub your head. Jeez, that, <laughs> you don't that do that anyway? So many, 
well, <laughs> that could just go so many different ways, but, um, I, um, what do you think, Mike? Like what, what, you know, your first thoughts, you know, we've been talking Indians baseball now. I, I think this is our uh, fifth year, you know, and they, they make it to the world series and, and we really haven't talked much over the past month. Uh, what are your takeaways from the playoffs takeaways from literally being a hit away, uh, this Indians team that from day one, our first podcast, we talked about the outfield and we are probably going to have a very similar conversation to end the year. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, first of all, I am Cleveland's good luck charm. And actually one of my like sort of offbeat stories is that the night before LeBron released his I'm coming home uh, letter with, with Lee Jenkins, I got engaged and actually like we were out late and like I had slept like an hour. I went and hopped in the shower and then my phone was blowing up and that's when I knew LeBron was coming home. But that's just a, a random story. But the Indians team, I really, a lot of what Jeff said, you know, the Indians, I think with Carrasco and Salazar healthy, were clearly the best team in the American league. Like I would have said they should have, they would have been the best team um, once they added Miller. But, you know, there wasn't a point in the playoffs where I thought they were the best team in the series, um, starting with the ALDS. And they were able to do some really cool progressive work with Miller, but still, I mean, that was just, you know, it was a team with a couple pretty big holes, and Josh Tomlin sort of had the run of the lifetime. And there's this sort of mythical belief that if you just, like, plug Carrasco in, it's going to get better. And, and really, like, I don't know if Carrasco or Salazar are going to top the first three starts that Tomlin had. Um, you know, sometimes baseball is just that way and I hope they would. Um, but, you know, I think it was just sort of random and, and really surreal. So I, I don't think it was as heartbreaking as it could have been. I think if they had been healthy and gone in, it would have been a lot more heartbreaking because I would have, you know, expected more out of them. But after we got a, out of the ALDS, everything just felt like gravy. Well, I, you know, you add Carrasco to that mix, just Carrasco. And, you know, I, with the finger incident with Trevor Bauer, that probably means Tomlin starts anyways. I think, boy, you know, they made that deal for Miller. And at the time we have the best rotation, in the American league. I mean, that felt like that felt really good. So the fact that we turned into a bullpen laden team and on top of that, it just, as I think about this with this possibility of having a 26th man, is it, it is like Terry Francona, does he know somebody in the front office? That, that's clearly – he's clearly done something to give them a 26 man. Like if they get a 26 man, it should be called the Francona bullpen rule because that's clearly for him. And that clearly helps the Indians with the way he handles the bullpen. But I digress. I don't want to talk about bullpen. I hate talking about the bullpen, although with Miller this year it will be a lot more fun. I want to talk outfield. Uh, Mike, you've written several pieces at, at WFNY. I wrote a piece as well about trading. Um, as we look at the Indians outfield as it stands right now, you've got Abraham Almonte coming back. You've got Brandon Geyer coming back. You've got Lonnie Chisenhall coming back. You've got Tyler Naquin coming back. And you hopefully have at some point, uh, and they haven't really said much about when Michael Brantley is going to be healthy, but at some point you have Brantley uh, coming back, hopefully healthy. As it stands right now, the outfield – has the same feel as it did in March of last year. We have this kind of piecemeal outfield that is basically platoon heavy. And I think it's going to be platoon heavy, even with Brantley. As it stands right now, they have to make a move. Now, Mike, you've talked about several, um, one being bringing in Matt Holiday, but I'm, I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with, before we get to the realities if there's one guy they need to get, who do they need to get? If they're going to go out and do something, is there a free agent they should be going after? Or should they, being one hit away from the World Series, is this the time that they literally should be going after someone big? I'm going to start with you, Mike, um, because you've written, you wrote the piece about Holiday, but you also talked about some, some potential deals. And I would say the deals you talked about as compared to mine were, were in the wheelhouse of what the Indians usually do. Um, but I ask you this, Mike, is it time for them to go big to answer the, to fill in some of that Mike Napoli hole with getting a guy with some, some youth, with some upside uh, in at center who can def improve them defensively and also uh, add to the offense. Is this the time to do that? 
I'm all in on them pushing the chips in for somebody like Pilar or Kiermaier, who we know is a plus defender and would have a couple of years control. I'm not so worried about, you know, making any offensive adjustments, but if you have that sort of up the middle defense, you know, with Perez, who's a plus defender with Lindor and who's an elite defender, Kipnis is okay at second now. And then you have an elite defender in center. I think you sort of build your defense off the middle of the field because of frequency. And I think that would be a huge advantage, especially for a pitching staff that doesn't really need an additional advantage, but would get one. So Jeff, I, I mean, I know who you're going to say, I know, I know who you want and, and, and I'm in this, but to get a guy like say you go after any of the five guys I mentioned, and we'll talk about names in a second. I, I want you to tell me who you think they should go after just because it's going to kind of segue into a lot of other discussion. I kind of folding over what Mike just said, you know, they go and get a guy. Um, do they, are you willing to spend the LaCroix package to bring in perhaps the guy who I think you want to bring in? Uh, I wish I felt more confident in, in the guy to be that guy. Um, I'm with Mike that I, I would be perfectly fine going all defense. Somebody who's average defensively and average offense. I just, you know, I, I don't want somebody completely, uh, you know, we talked about like McCutcheon, somebody like that. That's an offensive first kind of guy whose defense is going to be questionable. That scares me a little bit. Well, and, and offensively, I mean, you know, we, you could make a case based on past three years that he's heading down that Michael Bourne path. Right. Um, so I think that's something I would avoid. If they could find a, a defensive specialist kind of guy, I'd be perfectly fine with that. In terms of spending a big package, I'd have to make sure, you know, everybody has some question marks that's, that's going to probably be available. So it's a little bit frightening to give up the big package. Um, if we could get somebody like a Pilar or somebody like that, I think that would be a pretty interesting get. Would you, so looking at, you know, a guy that's been rumored to come to Cleveland, you, you look at um, Ender and Ciarte from the Braves. Uh, the Indians were in on him last year. Seem um, The Braves seem to be willing to move him. They're looking for a catcher uh, to both of you out there. You know, you even mentioned a guy like, I mean, there's four years control there. You look at a guy like, um, uh, Kiermaier, who's got four years control. I mean, you know, you, you both gold gloves, uh, which would immediately improve the defense. However, you know, I mean, what's the cost there? I mean, you're talking about two guys who are definitely defense first. I think, you know, NCRT obviously has more upside offensively, I think, than Kiermaier, but, you know, I mean, what's the cost there for a guy – for, for both, four years of control. I mean, you've got these guys still 2021. 20, you know, what's the cost? I mean, to me, even though they're defensive first guys, to me, those guys are still going to command a fairly large package. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wanted to take that? No, no yeah. I agree. I well, agree. In, the, in, the, in that pause, is just going to open up the door for, you know, large packages. But <laughs> it's, it, it is hard. For some reason, even though I just said that I would prefer them go get the def defensive specials kind of guy and focus on defense there, it's still hard to give up a big package for a guy whose bat just isn't going to be, um, you know, great at that position. Now, instead of field and offense is important. Uh, you know, we have guys like Zimmer coming up who hopefully can provide some offense maybe and, and slide over to like right field, something like that. But I, this is the time to do it if they're ever going to do it. You know, they've built up this farm system to, to have some prospects in it that they can move. And even if you look at some of the guys in the Lucroy deal, those were guys who weren't at positions that we're going to probably need for a little bit. Um, you know, I believe Meja is it Meja is the cent, the catcher. How do you yeah. pronounce his name? Man. Close I, Mejia Meja, go for it. I, I, I've, I've heard people who oh, yeah, know. I've heard, call I, okay. I've heard both too, you know, and, and, we're looking at the shortstop as the other guy in the deal, I believe, right, Chang? Yep. So, you know. That would make me cry, but it'd be worth it just to see him cry. Right, but those are positions that are pretty strong for us for quite a while, probably. Sure. So, you know, you, you are dealing from a bit of, uh, of a luxury position there for us. So, yeah, it, this is the time to do it. It's just hard for, I think, guys like us who follow the minors quite a bit to, to part with those. But, yeah, now's the time to do it. And if you can get those guys who, if they can be – you know, elite defensively and even just average offensively. That's a, that's a huge upgrade over Naquin who is neither. So yeah, I think it probably is the time to do it. If those guys are available at that package or, or right. around there. 
Right. Well, that's the big question. If those guys are available and I, I, you know, every year we go in with these big wish lists and get pissed off when they don't get these guys. But the reality is, you know, you, you, the real question, especially for Atlanta is why would you even want to deal a guy who literally came in was pretty outstanding hit lead off for you was uh, stout defensively and has four years of control. That to me seems like the perfect center fielder that you open up a brand new field with, but um, you know, maybe maybe a guy like Kiermaier is a guy who can bring in a lot of prospects and, and doesn't have the offensive upside. But I don't know, Mike, like, are you, you know, we, and we kind of want to bridge this over to Holiday. Um, you know, you, you, you wrote a really nice piece about uh, perhaps the best fit for the Indians would be to get a guy like Matt Holiday as opposed to bringing back uh, Mike Napoli based solely on the fact that, you know, Holiday can play in the outfield. He, um, you know, bat-wise, I think – um, I mean, let's, let's be honest, Napoli sort of came out of nowhere. And I think the last half of the season kind of reverted back to what we saw the year before, you know, if you get a guy like, like holiday, that doesn't necessarily stop you from going and getting a center fielder. Let me ask you this. Um, would you, would you spend, you know, would you throw in a lot in, in list? So we've been covering prospects, Mike, for, for five, four or five years together. You know, we love these guys. These are guys that we've grown up with really. But, you know, are you willing to throw it all in? I mean, this is, you know, how many times have we heard people say, if we get to the precipice, you, this is when you spend. Is it time for the Indians to start pounding down doors? Or are, it, are I mean, Frank Hona proved last year that you can kind of piecemeal it together. Do we tempt fate? And do we try to do it again with an outfield that could be fine if Brantley's fine? That's a big question. I mean, is it time to go all in and and talk about Matt Holiday? Yeah, I well, really, I, I love Holiday's fit just because I think he's close to the position that Napoli was in last year. He's not there because you know Holiday's always had a better track record. But you know, I think we're at that point where I think there's something left in his body, and he's coming off a season which sort of is an outlier, and we can sort of expect a, a nice little tick up. So that's that's really why I'm interested in the Holiday gamble. And, you know, I like guys who fit in the lineup who make a ton of contact, I think, because we have a lineup that's really built that way. And it's something that sort of, you know, grows exponentially in value when you add each contact hitter to that mix. So that's my, that's my thought. You know, I'm all in on the outfield deal. I also – defense is really interesting, and I think we've seen Major League Baseball sort of – I don't know if you can get – you know, by, based on public metrics, I think – you often spend about 80 cents on the dollar for what you would spend for somebody who gets three war from defense versus someone who gets three war from offense. And I think it's generally a little cheaper. I think last year we look at the Angelson Simmons trade um, and you have, you know, like a top 50 pitching prospect and Eric Ibar who really wasn't, wasn't much of anything other than just somebody to fill in and play short. And, and Simmons was, you know, essentially the best defender in the game yeah. coming into last season, pretty young, long-term control, I think four or five years of control. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I sort of wonder if the defense first outfielder like Pilar is a little cheaper than we might think he'd be, you know, maybe you have to give up a top 50 prospect, but maybe if you're giving up, you know, Naquin, you know, another outfielder who can play for them, and then McKenzie, who's going to be like a top 50, top 40 pitching prospect. You know, maybe you can get a deal done for somebody who can start in center for three years with a lead D. Um, and I think that that would make the Indians a lot better. And then I think you can still sort of spend money um, to fix that one base DH. I think the larger conversation about first base is and DH. And I talked about this with my Ramirez piece. It's, I think the implication of the flexibility stuff with Ramirez is um, – He's not playing second much. He's not playing short much. He's sure as hell not going to play a lot of center to his left field. And if we're flipping him to left field, that means that they're not particularly confident in Michael Brantley being Michael Brantley again, which I think sort of changes how they would go about this offseason if they think that. Well, I mean, how healthy is Michael Brantley going to be this offseason? I guess that's my next question because – a lot of what's going to happen is dependent on him. I think if you have a healthy Michael Brantley in left field, you know, and again, my question is when you have shoulder injuries that keep you out, but essentially for almost 18 months, when you look back to when the, uh, by the time he plays, when you look back to the initial injury, I mean, it's going to be uh, an 18 month deal. 
you know, when, you know, we've seen it before with, with a guy like Hafner who lost half of his power. And you're talking about a guy who went from 40 plus home runs to a guy who could barely get 20. You know, now we're talking about Michael Brantley, who was, whose power made him an MVP candidate. Now, I mean, don't get me wrong. He has a lot of intangibles at the plate, um, that IQ at the plate, knowing when to swing it at, at different pitchers and at, at different points in, in, um, in a pitch count. You know, he's still going to be valuable no matter what. But I think we can all agree that the power is what kind of took him to the next level. And, you know, I, I, you know, Jeff, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about this and Mike, we've talked a lot about this as well. I mean, is, is Michael Brantley going to be back? Is he going to be back? And is he going to be back, you know, you know, now at the wrong side of 30, you know, is he going to be back and is he going to be a valuable, you know, I mean, player offensively and will he ever be, you know, even close to an average defender now again with a bum shoulder? Yeah, and I think it gets extra hard because you have a guy like Jan Gomes who's almost in the exact same situation. <laughs> he can still play defensively quite a bit, but it's really hard to hide both of those guys on the roster and with playing time when they're both such huge question marks if they're ever going to be really viable you know, at their own position again. So I, it, it gets hard pretty quick. Um, but I think with Brantley, I mean, he was so good that you have to give him every opportunity. It, it's incredible that we went through this with Hafner and then again with Switcher. Um, <laughs> and now we're going to it with Brantley. Like, we just can't seem to get any luck. Um, but you have to give him every opportunity to prove that he still has it. Let me ask this real quick. Is Naquin a viable option for the opening day starter in center field? Or does the team think that he is? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, just based on... You know, what we kind of saw that last month, what we saw in the playoffs, their comments about him maybe moving to a corner. I, like, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around the Indians' move would be to keep him, to keep the outfield intact. Do Brantley, Naquin, Chisenhall. Um, if Naquin struggles, you have Zimmer hopefully forcing his way up pretty quickly. And if that flops too, you can try to swing a deal at the deadline, something like that. That, that sounds like the Indians' type move to me. But well, with what we saw in Naquin at the end there, you know, teams kind of figured him out. And when his defense kind of fell apart as well, I, I, I guess I, it, when we do the exercise of thinking about the outfield, I think it's interesting to think of whether they think the status quo is even an option or not. Well, I mean, my biggest fear, and uh, I'll be quick here because I want my Mike knows how I feel about Naquin and how I felt with him since he was, you know, here in Carolina. Um, you know, my fear, and, and I think we've shared this fear, you know, for the past year is that because of the abundance of pieces that they have, and, and it's not like they're, they're supremely movable pieces, you know, talking about the value of a Chisholm Hall, talking about the value of a Naquin, even though he finished third in uh, rookie of the year voting to me is, is an interesting question. You, know, you look at the viable pieces. We've mentioned the five guys they have out there now, and you, you talked about Zimmer and we haven't even talked about Greg Allen or Yandy Diaz, who, um, you know, probably are supplemental at, at this point uh, throughout the year. My thinking is, is Naquin's a guy that's going to be there again. I think they think he's a seasoned guy now. He's been through a World Series and he made a mistake and he's going to learn from it. And this seems to be the kind of thinking that um, they're going. I mean, when, when you look at when you look at the cost effectiveness and, and where they try to find market inefficiencies, to me, I feel like they think the way they've put together this outfield is a market inefficiency that they've taken advantage of. Now, when the pressure came down in the World Series, you know, so much for the market inefficiency because they look like, you know, I mean, nothing against Chisholm Hall and Naquin, but they, they look like idiots out there. Hey, more Naquin, which is, is kind of worse being that he's been an outfielder I, his whole life as far as I know, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I think they've always eyeballed him as a corner outfielder. I, I know in Carolina, he played some right. He played some left too. Um, I think this has always been the plan with him. I think they thought they had Frazier and Zimmer as a lock in center. I think they probably still feel that way with Zimmer. I really think that this Greg Allen, I think that Greg Allen is putting on the kind of performance that is the Jose Ramirez did. I mean, he's a little bit older, obviously, but I think he's opening eyes the same way that Jose Ramirez did. I, I, a lot of people say he's too far away. I think if anybody's going to be moving anyone away from center field, I, I see, I, I mean, I, I'm hard pressed to see a guy twice and have him make four or five catches that just made people stand up. So, I mean, 
he's clearly on their radar. They're clearly doing things with him that make me think that he could be viable by June or July. Um, so I, I, my fear, Jeff, is that they have answers and that their answers are question marks, but they can, they feel like they can piecemeal it all together. Um, Mike, what do you think? Ugh. And I say fear, I say fear, but this is the exact same freaking conversation we had in March and they made it to the World Series. So maybe fear is the wrong one. Certainly. Oh, yeah, I'm all in on Greg Allen. I mean, you love his defense and I just his plate discipline is off the charts, you know, and he he's hitting the ball with more contact authority. Man, I I'm higher on him playing center field and maybe the outfield than Brad Zimmer long term. And you know what I get sick of is these people who like when somebody's like four years from the bigs, they're like, oh, he's going to have to move to a corner. He's not a great defender. Then we have a center fielder who's like pretty close to the bigs and he doesn't have a great bat. And we're like, oh, man, he's a really good defender. It's really rangy. Like I've, I've seen that with Tyler Nagel and I don't need to see that anymore. Um, and also I just going into this season, if Brantley is healthy, the, the large river that will be running in left center field between Tyler Naquin and Michael Brantley is pretty <laughs> scary. Uh, so oh. I think they may go in with that route, um, but I, I think it's it's foolish, and I, I think they can cheaply. I don't even I don't even think Naquin is the best center. Like I think Abraham Almonte is clearly the best center fielder on this team. And maybe offensively he surpasses Naquin next year. I just don't buy into Naquin's 2016 campaign. There's way too much swing and miss. I, I think Almonte is probably the best starting center fielder. And yeah, that's, and that's depressing. And I, and then that's, and I'm Almonte's biggest fan, but that's yeah. depressing. It's interesting too, that we're hearing all this about Yandy Diaz playing so much center field yeah. because yeah, well, now we have Naquin and Almonte and Yandy Diaz and, you know, Greg Allen's not far away. Zimmer's even closer. There's, it, there's so many options and none of them are great, you know, and I'm, I, I'm excited about Greg Allen, but I'm, I, I would be pretty surprised if we saw him in the major league level this year. You want to make a bet? I will. I, I will definitely make you a bet. I'll make a beer bet. Okay. I'm in on the beer bet. I don't know which side I'm on, though. I, I should let you guys hash it out, and then I'll just pick my favorite side. I, I like that idea. I do we'll like the idea here. of – I do like the idea of when you mention guys like Diaz and you mention guys like Allen, the thing that, that to me – and I think this is probably where Mike's going with this. To me, what the difference maker is when you look at – I mean, you essentially – both those guys mirror Jose Ramirez in the way he approaches – uh, you know, swinging at the plate, you know, they don't strike out a lot. And um, you, you go back further, you know, the, the, this basically falls in line with the Michael Brantley mode of player. And, and since Brantley, they've, they've been eyeballing players like this. I think the thing in their corner in Yandy Diaz's corner and Greg Allen's corner is that they, they, they get on base. I mean, I mean, I, I don't know where you're going with this, Mike, but I think maybe that's where you're heading. No, I, I just think the guys that the Indians push the envelope with, and, and you mentioned it, you know, they pushed the envelope with Ramirez and they pushed it a little bit. Um, they pushed it a little bit with, with Lindor as well, is these are dudes yeah. who make a lot of contact. Yeah. Because those guys, I think, are less prone to getting lost and sort of broken. The guy who's striking out a ton and then seeing his K rate just massively high, I think you can sort of break that guy if you rush him. And don't let them develop that. But the guys who make a ton of contact and can sort of like not embarrass themselves at the plate early and play good defense, those are the ones that I think they'll be more aggressive with. Um, so that's my only reason. You know, I, I think they've been, you know, I think they rushed him and got him a decent amount of playing time at Double A last year for a reason. I don't, I don't think that was just a just a passive yeah. thing. But I do want to redirect because Jim wrote this really long trade piece on center field, laying out all the options and he's, and he's poked and prodded us for, for our options. But like, who are you all in on? Like if you're going to give up Mejia and another big piece, is there a guy in that, in that range that you're willing to give it up for? Is it Pollock? Is it Kiermaier? Who is it? I mean, for me, I, I, well, I mean, I, I think the home run for me is Pollock. I mean, I, I, his, he's injury prone is the problem. But I think if you're going to spend money or, I mean, you're going to spend player collateral 
for a guy who doesn't need any work. That's the guy. He can do everything. He's a great defender by every metric. When he's healthy, he's, you know, I mean, you know, when you hear phrases like Mike Trout light, you, you like that. The problem with Mike Trout light, when your body's a little brittle, is you get hurt a lot. But I mean, for me, the guy that's perfect for this lineup, who immediately gets to the top of the order, you know, has speed, has a glove, and can hit 320, it, it can do everything with the stick, hit for some power too, it's Pollock. And I think if there's a team who's willing to move a guy like like that, it'd be Arizona, especially with Stewart leaving. So, so the home run for me is Pollock, followed probably closely by um, by Namina's boy there in Atlanta. I, you know, there's a guy I that j- defensively looks great, and while offensively his, you know, he's not, you know, he's he's not going to hit. 10 home runs for you, but you know, there's a guy I think that has a tremendous amount of upside in in the four year window. I, I, I just think NCR day would be my, my second choice, but Pollock for me would be my all in. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. I think Pollock is the guy that you're, you feel comfortable giving up that whole package for and not really even thinking twice about it. I'm definitely a huge NCR day guy. Um, The only problem is it feels like, and maybe we're, way over hyping him at this point, but it feels like Greg Allen is kind of going to be the, the poor man's version of that kind of guy. Yeah. Well, and it's hard cause he's so close. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why I've, I know I've been kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth, this whole podcast that they need to make a move. And yet I don't know if they should make a move. And I, it, it's because Greg Allen kind of looms over everything and you don't know how close he is. You don't know how much we're over hyping him at this point. You know, I mean, we're all yeah. very excited. Don't get me wrong. I think he's going to be awesome, but <sighs> it's easy to fall in love with these guys too. And, and he's still a ways away and who knows what happens when he gets to the next level. So I, that, that, that's the thing that holds me back. Pollock is the obvious, you know, that, that makes a ton of sense. The other guys, um, Kiermaier and Ciarte, I, I like the idea of both of them, but it gets hard when you wonder what the cost is in terms of prospects when you have a Greg Allen this close. And, but, but then again, what's the cost of not having a center fielder this season? Cause Greg Allen's not likely to be ready. Right. I, uh, who's your guy, Mike? I mean, I, we actually haven't talked about this. I, I, I'm curious. I mean, I, I listed five guys. There's other guys on that list. I mean, is, is, is the guy on that list for you? I'm scared. There's nothing about this. I like, you know, it's, it seems like there's no middle option. There's no like two or he's going to be fine. He can defend in center option on the table. It's, Signing John Jay, who's garbage, <laughs> not garbage, but like he's not an upgrade over Abraham Almonte probably, or there's, oh, we have to trade the farm for like Kiermaier or Enciarte or Pollock. And, you know, it's sort of staggering to me that there isn't a middle ground. And I do want to, I think Nam makes a good point in that, you know, I don't want to overhype Greg Allen. When I fall in love with dudes, I usually fall in love with guys who I just think have like really high floors. Like I know they're going to be useful big league players. And that's sort of like how I feel with Allen, especially since Jim's seen his defense. Like I know his floor is a fourth outfielder who makes contact and plays good defense. And so I always fall in love with those dudes when I think it's a pretty easy equation for him to get to two to three war versus like when I see a guy who makes, you know, strikes out a ton and may not have a position, I sort of get more nervous and I don't love high ceiling, really low floor guys. It's sort of why I love Allen, but I think the solution I wonder if you can get him cheaper because of the injury risk. I wonder what the cost looks like. I think I have no idea what the cost looks like. I also wonder how much value Salazar has on the market. He's probably depreciated, but he makes me really nervous. And I wouldn't mind building a high risk deal around Salazar Pollock and then another piece. Um, and I love Salazar. I just have a lot of concerns about his long-term arm health. But, you know, I think if you're going to go in, go go get Pollock. He upgrades you in both defense and offense. Um, and I think you can probably get him for around what you're going to pay for Kiermaier because Kiermaier was healthy last year. Yeah. Well, there, I mean, I, you know, I, and I got, I just want to say this, and, and this is not hyperbole. I've seen a lot of baseball in my life. I, Greg Allen made the single greatest catch I've ever seen. I, I, and it's not hyperbole. I've never seen a catch like it, even close to it. Um, 
I, and, and he made four or five other plays that same game that made people stand up. I, I, defensively, he's, he doesn't need work. You know, I mean, he's a guy who's going to have impact. So one last question. We talk about these high contact guys. We haven't really talked a lot. Bradley Zimmer, uh, this guy who struck out, I, I want to say at the end of the year, he was over 35%. Is it possible that with all of these high contact guys at the plate that his striking out a lot won't mean so much when you have guys surrounding him that get on base a lot? What do you think, Jeff? Uh, I mean, that's kind of what we had with Napoli this year. Um, yeah except Napoli's power and, and some of his other skills are you know, probably superior to that of Zimmer, although Zimmer's speed and hopefully his defense, at least in the corner, um, should be pretty good when he replaces uh, Chiz, you know, right away this year. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, he scares me quite a bit. I try to talk myself into him being able to take quite a few walks, having some decent plate disciplines getting some power and some speed um, to kind of offset those strikeouts and really kind of offsetting and everything else. I like the music track. Um, but uh, yeah, he scares me. I don't know if his other skills are going to offset things enough that the lack of contact is going to be kind of nullified by those around him. Uh, Mike, you got to be chomping at the bit for this one, right? <laughs> I, I feel really bad. I think he can still be a good MLB player. I just, I'm scared. No, so <sighs> that's a lot of pause language I just used there. And do you do you deal him? Do you deal him? Is he the guy you deal? Like, I mean, yeah. let's get to it. Is he the yeah, guy you put no in? Question. Listen, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a top thirty guy heading into the offseason. We know that's probably going to fall. Is he the guy you put in a deal for, say, a Pollock, and you just be okay? You know, I mean, Allen was in the LaCroix deal. Do you put Allen, do you take Allen out of that because he's a defensive guy and do you put Zimmer into it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think the thing is, I think Zimmer does have a relatively high ceiling. I mean, he could fix the strikeout rate, but it's so rare. I mean, he's 24. He's been like older, average age for his level the whole time. He's not some young guy like where, where you could sort of expect adjustments. And I, I just think that his best case scenario feels a lot like Colby Rasmus's best season, which is really good. Like he posted a nice like four war season and, and that would be awesome. But I think that's probably where his best case scenario lies because of how little contact he makes, or maybe he's a more athletic Adam, less power Adam Dunn. But I mean, it's somewhere in that capped by his contact issues. I think he's probably a three to four war player ceiling. And, and I don't know if his floor is that great. I think the floor could be really pretty ugly um, just because of the swing and miss. So I really hope I can make enough contact to let the power play up, but you know, I don't buy in it. And as for the lineup fit, it depends who he offsets. You know, I think if he offsets Naquin, it's fine. And then we sort of upgrade the contact rate for Napoli's hole in the lineup. But if you have, like, Nako and Zimmer in the bottom of the order, I mean, that could be a real contact nightmare. <laughs> oh, God. Well, let me ask this, too. What do we – is Zimmer going to play center field long-term? Is he going to play it well? I feel like he's kind of in that Naquin territory where you just hear wildly different scouting reports of his defense in center. I know he's athletic, but that's, you know, not everything there. I, I think Isn't he's... the problem – Go ahead, Mike. Isn't the problem, too, that, like – we're saying, and I, I agree that we hear different scouting reports, but they're not wild in one sense. Nobody ever says he's a good defender in center. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you I know, mean, he We're in like, comparison oh, to a guy like Clint Frazier, who um, had his issues in center, and I've I've, I've seen them. I, I I think, you know, Zimmer approach like he's Zimmer is the typical guy. <laughs> he's got an incredible approach to working on skills. Uh, so he's always a guy that the coaches love. He's always a guy that's going, you're going to hear a lot of good things about from the coaching staff that doesn't match with scouts. Um, and, and, and Naquin, Naquin was a little bit like that. You'd hear a lot of good things from the coaching staff, which of course you'd then hear mimicked from people who didn't actually talk to scouts who'd say how great of a defender he is. Um, so I think I, by the eye test, he's a, he's a right fielder. I mean, he's a right fielder. He's got a good arm. 
Um, I think he's a better defender at the end of the day than, than Naquin, but I mean, I've never thought Naquin was even a close to average defender. So, you know, I, I don't know what that means. So, I, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I think with the current crop of outfielders, if there's an injury, he's coming up and playing center this year. That's what I think, unless they move him or move somebody else. And I guess that's that's the car right there, the cat, the cat. <laughs> Perfect <and> timing. <laughs> uh, I don't. I I don't know. I I mean I I just I think we need a definitive answer in the outfield, and I don't. We don't have that right now. I mean. You know, the fact, I mean, I would honestly, with who we have right now, Abraham Almonte is who I want in center 120 games. Screw the platoon. I want him in there as much as possible with the guys we have. Well, and it's hard too because center's somewhat of a hole right now. You have no idea what you're getting from Brantley. And I mean, I know I'm the anti Chiz guy, but I I don't feel like you know exactly what you're going to get. He could very easily play average defense and be pretty below average offensively next year and have to platoon and that's not super valuable either you know like all three positions to me are kind of up in the air and I know that that's me being overly negative on right field but that's what makes it so hard it would be great to have one of those solved (laughs) right well and and if Brantley if Brantley's not healthy I mean it's it's again it's you know it's plug and play and and pray for the best and we had Naquin basically leading the rookie of the year you know vote for two thirds of the year. And are we getting that this year? Probably not. You know, is Almonte going to fill in the gap? No. Is Brantley going to fill in the gap? We don't know. I heard today it could be up to two months. He's not going to, I mean, I, I haven't heard anything, you know, the Indians are going to say anything. So I don't know. I mean, you know, the fact that they might consider bringing in a third baseman to put, you know, Jose Ramirez in left, which is awesome. I love it, but <laughs> I mean, it's it's like a party every you know. I mean, what's what kind of crazy crazy ass play because he charges in fifteen feet and then has to make a catch at the warning track because he's so fat. I mean, it's insane. I you know, and you've got Yandy Diaz who's probably the, in the same boat. I mean, you could have us. We can have Diaz in center, and are we going to have J Ram in left and Chisenhall in right? I mean, what the hell is that? We'll, we'll have the all infield outfield. It'll be great. <laughs> God. Imagine the shifts Frankona could put on then. Holy We're shit. We're going to have three third basemen playing the outfield. It's going to be a spectacular. <laughs> this is the new market efficiency is finding all third basemen. Just every position is actually third base. Oh, my God. The every sad position thing is, is the hot corner. If he listens to this, I think he'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We didn't even talk about Frankona winning manager of the year. I think we save that for the next one. Yeah, that's not a good conversation to have with me on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we got we got we got to wrap this bad boy up. I, I um, first of all, gentlemen, it's been fun. I'm glad we're back. I don't know what this is going to look like in the coming weeks, but uh, hopefully, we can keep this going. Definitely want to get that. I want Mike Hattery talking about Terry Francona winning the Manager of the Year. That is a podcast. I just want to say segue with that and then just back off. But that's the all funny. Francona and Zimmer podcast with Mike Hattery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. We're going to wrap things up here. Um, thanks for joining us. It's the EHC podcast at WFNY. Try to put that all together and figure it out. I don't know what this thing's going to be called, but that's what it's called for now. Um, again, if you want to check us out, you can find us on Twitter at sports nom for Jeff nomina at snarky hat man for, for my cattery. And I don't even know what the hell mine is now at Jim Pete EHC. i really did wear socks and sandals. That's the way to go. Uh, this is probably be the last time you hear from us. So happy Thanksgiving. And, uh, We'll talk to you soon.